Alessandro Arrigo will talk to us about the possibility of visualizing neural cells with OCT, a possibility I have already mentioned in chapter 6, but which will be developed in more detail here. Alessandro is resident at the San Raffaele University Hospital in Milano. He is active scientific collaborator with Electronic Engineering Department of University of Cagliari in the field of post-processing imaging elaboration and predictive models development. He was also member of a neuroscience research group for seven years at the Department of Biomedical Science and Morphological and Functional Images of the University of Messina. In this presentation, we will talk about a new technique for the in vivo detection of extrafoveal Mueller cells in the human retina through optical coherence tomography. Mueller cells represent the major glial cytotype in the vertebrate retina. These cells are responsible for the homeostatic and metabolic support of the other retinal cells and are confined between the inner and the outer retinal limiting membranes. The morphology and number of Mueller cells vary among different species. The human retina contains an extremely high concentration, reaching a Mueller cell's mean density measure than 30,000 cells for each square millimeter in the fovea. Mueller cells are characterized by a vertical transretinal orientation. A key feature of the Mueller cells is that the more is the proximity to the fovea, the higher is the probability to assume a Z-shape morphology. Furthermore, the size and shape of the Mueller cells vary also in different retinal regions. Indeed, Mueller cells result thick and short in the periphery and thin and long in the fovea. The theoretical assumption for the in vivo detection of Mueller cells is based on the peculiar function of concentrating the light stimulus reaching the photoreceptors. This function, associated with the biomolecular composition of Mueller cells, makes the cytotype able not to interfere with the light passage and absorption. For all these reasons, Mueller cells are assumed to result hyperreflective on OCT scans. In our study, starting from high-resolution OCT images, we isolated the linear transretinal hyperreflective signal. Our OCT-derived Mueller cells disclose a very good matching with histology-derived cells marked with GFAP and Vimentin. More in details, our algorithm worked very good with extrafoveal Mueller cells. However, it discloses limitations in detecting foveal Mueller cells. The main reason of this limitation is related with the specific features of foveal Mueller cells, resulting longer, thinner, and with a Z-shape morphology. On the contrary, extrafoveal Mueller cells are shorter, thicker, and vertically oriented, thus making possible their proper detection. Furthermore, we have to take into account the current resolution limitations of OCT devices, almost 8 micrometers. 
Considering the diameter range of Muller cells between 4 and 16 micrometers, a possible underestimation is likely expected. These are some useful and interesting scientific papers dedicated on the topic of Muller cells. I would like to thank my co-authors for the excellent teamwork. And finally, thank you all for the kind attention. Where Professor Quarques points out that the alterations in Mueller cell cause them to lose contact with the pigment epithel. At this point, the pigment epithel pump effect is lost and there is an accumulation of subretinal fluid. The understanding of Mueller cells dysfunction in diabetic macroedema has granted a better understanding of OCT findings in this disorder. In details, we have a better comprehension of three important OCT findings. First, in diabetic macroedema, the intraretinal fluid may physically separate and displace Mueller cells processes that are thus visible on OCT images as hyperreflective calamar elements. Second, on emphase OCT, diabetic macroedema is characterized by hyperreflective spaces around the fovea. The latter Configuration is secondary to the orientation of Mueller cells extending from the foveal center. Third, Mueller cells are determinant in maintaining retinal structure. However, they may be unable to remain in contact with uh, the RPE with consequent formation of subretinal fluid as detected with OCT. The loss of this contact may also cause a dysfunction of the outward directed pump of the RPE with consequent worsening of the subretinal and intraretinal fluid. Bernardo is an excellent retinal surgeon who combines great clinical knowledge with an acute scientific interest and his clear and concise presentation will not fail to arouse your interest. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bernard Henrik and I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate and to contribute to this um, excellent project. I've been asked to present myself in a few words. I am a vitro retinal surgeon with Oftacentro Lugano, Switzerland and also a professor of ophthalmology with the Università della Svizzera Italiana. I'm a teacher at Basel University and an attending surgeon with Winterthur Cantonal Hospital in the canton of Zurich. Basement membranes separate highly specialized tissues from connective tissues. In the example of this image, we're looking at a basement membrane, the brown curved line in the middle of the um, image, which separates the epithelium from the subcuticular layers of the dermis. Basement membranes are made of fine sheets of cell-free extracellular matrix proteins. They can be found in all organs. The concept of separating connective tissues from epithelia seems to be evolutionarily important. It's a concept which has been conserved for over 500 million years and is found in all protozoans. In other words, it's a concept which we humans share with all other animals from, from worms to primates. I hosts several different basement membranes and from a scientific viewpoint the eye is a very interesting uh, organ um, because it is one of the few places if not the only one where basement membranes can be relatively 
easily harvested. The internal limiting membrane, the ILM, is one of the several basement membranes of the eye, um, and it is considered to be the basement membrane, actually, of the retinal neuroepithelium. Our laboratory could show that, differently from common belief, basement membranes are not made up of a homogeneous mix of extracellular matrix proteins, uh, but are rather bipolar. They show two very distinct surfaces. And, uh, for example, in the image that you are looking at, you can see the two different sides of the ILM um, in an atomic force microscopic image. You see one surface which is wrinkled, that's the retinal surface, and one surface which is very smooth, that's the vitreous interface of the ILM. So, like all other basement membranes, the ILM shows a bipolar setup. The retinal surface of the ILM is marked by collagen 4 as its main constituent, while the vitreous surface has a very high concentration of laminin. The vicinity of the ILM with the Mueller cells suggests that the retina, or more specifically Mueller cell footplates, should be the major source of ILM proteins. But that commonly accepted hypothesis is not compatible with the fact that ILM protein mRNA has not been detected in the neuroretina. Publications by our own laboratory and others have shown that almost all ILM proteins are synthesized by the lens epithelium and the future ciliary body during our own uh, fetal prenatal period. So, contrary to current belief, the ILM is synthesized by the lens and the ciliary body, not by the retina. That does not mean, however, that Mueller cells would not play a role in the production of the ILM, um, as their receptors for laminin and collagen 4 promote ILM assembly. So the sequence of events in ILM synthesis is as follows. First, ILM proteins are secreted into the vitreous. They then diffuse to the retinal surface where they bind to receptors on Mueller footplates and are thus assembled into forming the ILM. ILM assembly occurs predominantly during fetal and early postnatal life. Activity is greatly reduced during adult life But the ILM does show a constant thickening during aging, so that there is a discussion uh, whether a continued low-level ILM protein synthesis might occur. Differently from what we've discussed so far, epiretinal membranes are avascular, fibrocellular membranes, which grow on top of the ILM, which we've been speaking about so far. This process occurs when microglia cells gain access to the preretinal surface. Five major cell types have been described to be involved in this process: retinal pigment epithelial cells, macrophages, fibrocytes, fibrous astrocytes, and myofibroblast-like cells. There seems to be some form of interaction between the uh, mentioned cells and segments of retained vitreous. Once this process is started, epiretinal membranes may undergo contraction, creating tangential forces, which clinically result in retinal folding and macular puckers. There are conflicting theories on the origin of preretinal cells. 
It has been suggested that a posterior vitreal detachment may tear, evulse, or cause a dehiscence of the internal limiting membrane. Another theory suggests that segments of cellular vitreous remain on the surface after on, on the retinal surface after a posterior vitreal detachment. In my opinion, the fact that hyalocytes um, are the cells with the greatest potential to, de to develop into myofibroblast-like cells um, lends some credibility to the latter theory. In any case, the transdifferentiation um, into cells with myofibroblastic properties and the capacity to synthesize collagen appear to be at the basis uh, for, con for the contractile properties of aperitinal membranes. I kindly asked Elizabeth to comment on Professor Enrich's exposition from a biological point of view. My attention was drawn to a recent article of hers in which she mentioned a work done with Professor Leuenberger in 2004 in which they found dendrocytic cells on the anterior capsule of the crystalline lens. In our comment, Elizabeth confirms both topographic and ontogenetic heterogeneity in this important frontier zone, which is the ILM. To you, Elizabeth. During development, an intensive and synchronous synthesis of the various ILM and vitreous components takes place. Different cell types participate in ILM formation. Early in embryonic development, Müller cells differentiate within the eye cap. Thereafter, astrocytes immigrate into the retina from the spinal cord. Müller cells and astrocytes synthesize different forms of laminin. Lens importantly contributes to ILM formation. Retinal ganglion cells even seem to participate in ILM synthesis. Later on, the ciliary epithelium becomes one of the main source of ILM components. During adult life, the ILM turnover is very low. It is not completely established yet which macromolecular constituents of the ILM are produced by which cell type. Putatively, the contribution of ontogenetically different cell types to the formation of ILM produces regional structural heterogeneities favoring alterations, which finally leads to characteristic age-related pathologies of both ILM and retina. Thank you, and uh, I want just to see to you all this video that surprising me about uh, Claudio Zetlub of uh, Brazil University, and uh, he reconstructed uh, the uh, old vascular layers of the high without uh, dye injection in uh, 3D possibility to see the vascular aspect that uh, probably could be the futures for all clinicians. Thank you again to Philippe. The primate fovea is a retinal specialization for high resolution color vision. The centrifugal displacement of the inner retinal layers away from the path of the incoming light and the absence of blood vessels may improve the quality of the visual image received by the highly packed cone photoreceptors in the foveola. There is an increasing knowledge regarding the important role of Mueller cells and astrocytes in the foveola development and function, and pathogenic role of Mueller cell dysfunction in the development of age-related macular disorders. OCT, in combination with other techniques such as microscopy on histological preparations, may provide novel insights into the pathomechanism of foveal functioning and dysfunctioning. In conclusion, our algorithm allows to detect and quantify extrafoveal Mueller cells in vivo in the human retina. 
Further technical advances are needed to improve the sensitivity of this approach, especially looking for the foveal Muller cells isolation. If confirmed by further studies, this approach might pave the stone for new perspectives in the field of retinal and neurological diseases. Professor Leuenberger, dear Peter, thank you so much for this wonderful speech on basic research. What is your personal opinion about the importance of the research on Mueller cells? The studies about retinal glia allows us a better understanding of specific diseases and permits us to target more efficiently treatments. We have reached the end of our journey on the Mueller cells. We have discovered its many potential, but much remains to be discovered. We hope that we have aroused your interest. It was great to have you on board on this excursion, and this repays us for all our efforts. A big huge from the whole team. Gemento.com 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 Gemento
www.thepeopleshow.com.